Let's get started. First, let me say Uber good morning to our colleagues in Salt Lake City. Uh, good morning here, afternoon in Europe, and, and as always, good evening to all of you in Asia. So tell us your story. What do you want people to know? Like a lot of people here, you know, I was um, aided by not having to supply my own motivation. You know, we had to go out and get, you know, work. So went to school on financial aid and still didn't know what I wanted to do. And so the natural path for Did some... your parents go to college? Were you were first generation? Yep. And my sibling didn't. I would say most people are exceptional. Mm. Have these kind of things and things that, you know, drove them and, and inspired them. And I really do think, I don't mean to be funny or ironic in saying this, but a lot of people, you know, it's, it's pretty... Um, it's pretty advantageous to have motiv you know, to be motivated and have it supplied to as opposed to having to source it. And so most of the people that you'll see here in, in good positions, by the way, you're not always just motivated because you need to you know, pay for school or earn, you know, because you don't. People have to source, they, you know, get themselves motivated and find a source. And it's presented to you or you get it, and maybe because you're competing with you know, a sibling or a parent or some myth or something else that, you know, source it or you need, you know, that's, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it takes to, to drive you, you get driven. So I was that kind of person, but not necessarily that focused. So I, I went to law school because it was an extension of liberal arts. What did you major in? Tell everybody in college. I majored in uh, social studies. I was, I was a pretty, you know, not, I, I wouldn't say I was the best student in the world. I think my, my diploma, I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure I met the requirements when I major. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I still have nightmares where I have to like, you know, I have to go in the drawer and look at my diploma to make sure, to remind myself that I actually got it. Um, <laughs> But I did get, uh, you know, I did go through law school, and then, of course, you, you get a lot out of law school. Um, you know, you learn a lot, but the most you get out of law school is debt. And so guess what? Then you become a lawyer, because that's what you're trained to do. And I practiced law for five years. I lived in New York, finance town. A lot of people are in finance, so I applied to, um, to jobs on Wall Street. And the only place I got a job in was J. Aaron and Company, which was, the com uh, which was a commodities trading firm, which right after or about the time I was applying to them was acquired by Goldman Sachs. And that's how I got into, that's how I started, uh, you know, uh, at Goldman Sachs. And if you would ask me, did I have everything nailed down and wired about what I wanted to do and was I following some real plan? Uh, no. In fact, by the time I was in, in my mid-20s or late, even late 20s, and I was still in a law firm, I really was starting to get a little nervous that I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and uh, you know, I started getting a little bit. Uh, you know, my hands were starting to get a little sweaty about because I, re you know, because whatever I decided to do, I, I would want to be good at it. But I, you know, in order to be good at it, you have to start, and I hadn't started. And so um, now people feel like that when they're 16, um, which is, I think is one of the one of the oppressive features of this generation. Which, by the way, everyone, you know, which I don't think is that radically different from you know everybody. Every everybody's a little bit different, but one of the things. That, I, that strikes me as different about people today is that people get a little bit nervous if they're, you know, if they're not, you know, people start marking themselves to market versus their friends and people they read about when they're about 18 and think that if they haven't dropped out of college and started something by, you know, by the time they're 19, they're over the hill. One of the things that you've often highlighted was part of our uh, forward strategy and confidence that you have in the long term centers around people and that recruiting is a big part of that. Can you expand on how you think about people in the equation of the Goldman Sachs success formula? This is a entirely people business. We're you know, advisors and market makers and investors. The feedstock of our machine is, um, you know, you know, is people and talent, and we have to you know, get the best of it. And, and once we get them, we try to improve what we got and try to make people better. By the way, that's also, a, that's also an iterative thing mm -hmm. because the better people come here because they think it'll be good for them. Um, and then, of course, then you get the best people and it becomes good for them because as people grow up in the firm, they you know, better mentors make better people. And when people come in, they, 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 they get a sense of what their obligations are to the, to the next generation. And you get a kind of a virtuous circle here. We're very conscious of the people aspect of this and we spend a lot of time in recruiting people, and we spend a lot more time in developing people once they're here. Recently, we um, launched an analyst impact fund, and I want to spend a minute getting your thoughts on that. For everyone's reference, 460 analysts submitted applications, six finalists got to pitch to the partnership committee, 
and three groups were awarded uh, $175,000 uh, that were contributed from our partners, and uh, Lloyd then wanted to uh, give personally to those uh, folks that were fourth, fifth, and sixth. You joined us at the Partnership Committee um, and heard these presentations. What did you think about yeah. that? Well, just about, I don't know if everybody knows what we, you know, there's a firm that we, we, you know, we do a lot of, um, I mean, a lot of firms do. We particularly do a lot of philanthropy, partners as, in, as individuals, but also collectively as a firm. Mm -hmm. And also we try to do things that not just like write checks, but we try to do things where we use you know, our skills and our background and, and actually validate what we do for a living and, and try to show how that, you know, you know, for public service and public good. Uh, and one of the streams that we focused on as the committee was you know, the analyst experience, all aspects of it. And we heard time and time again that our analysts really wanted to know how they could make an impact, to really understand how they can leverage the firm to invest in philanthropic organizations yeah. that they care so about. So being the way we are, we allow people to form teams all around, you know, around the world and to promote a, um, a particular charity or an institution they wanted to support, teams of, I, I, my observation was anywhere between three and six people. That's right got together, and I think we had something like 134 teams get together and promoted a particular philanthropy they were committed to. And then again, in Goldman Sachs style, they prepared, you know, flip books and charts and these things, you know, real kind of, you know, real kind of downtown kind of presentations that you would do for an IPO pitch or, you know, an M&A pitch, because who knows better how to do this stuff than the analysts. Um, and <laughs> come in, they made presentations, winnowed it down to six groups, and um, then the uh, partnership sat in judgment and um, <laughs> eventually, you know, uh, and, and allocated $100,000 for the prize and then mm -hmm. 50 and 25. And then, of course, we were supposed to send three people, back, oh, three groups away empty handed, but tugged at our heart. So we gave them money too to give away. Get, we get soft. <laughs> and then, um, but it was good. And some of them were real, you know, pretty cool things. So, you know, it was good. So that was, a, you know, that was, I thought that was clever. What advice would you give to people, to, that, to our, 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 well, I would, you know, it's funny, you know, it's different looking back. You know, I don't know. I think, you know, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's the cur it's the reality and it's the curse that you don't have the benefit of going forward and looking back. You know, you have to live through it. So I, I, I'll give you advice that's impossible to follow, right. which is chill out. But I wouldn't have been chilled. And if I had, it to, <laughs> if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't. You know, there's not a sport, there's not an activity in life where if you have a really hard grip, you actually are better. You know, whether it's baseball or golf or you, you know, you're kicking a ball or something like that, the looser you are, the further the thing goes, you know, because it's a lot easier to whip around a string than it is a, a, a stick. And you know, if you're tight, and I'm speaking metaphorically, if you're really tight, you're not necessarily better, but that's advice that if I gave it, if I came back and visited my younger self, I wouldn't have been able to follow it. You know, I read a lot of history and I like that. And I think that that's better than economics in a mm. lot of ways or studying markets when you're young because history is a little bit reassuring because you can read about people's lives and you can see all these people who did great things failed six times or yeah. didn't, didn't, didn't get going on what their life work was going to be until they were much older or all the frustrations, the detours, the disappointments, the, the, you know, that. I think that's a lot more instructive and educational. By the way, cycles, you know, everybody, you know, when everybody makes their predictions about where the world is going or this, basically what people are doing is, you know, extrapolating yesterday. You know, if, if the world looks down, everybody thinks it's going lower. If the world is doing well, everyone thinks it's going high, you know, most of the time. Um, if you turn on the TV or, you know, one of these business shows, you see that. I think if you study history, you become much more aware of the cyclicality of things. Right. Or that what you're thinking, somebody else thought about 2,000 years ago and articulated pretty well. And it's not that new. And in some ways, that that's reassuring because people have gotten through stuff. How long have you been a partner, Lloyd? Um, 28 years. A lot of people here aren't 28. <laughs> I, a partner. I think we're the only people in the room. Yeah, I've been a partner 28 years. And I would say, and maybe this would be a, con I don't know if it makes you feel better or worse, but I wouldn't have known. Now, that's the way I'm wired. I've known people in my life who look like they were pegged for greatness when they were in kindergarten 
all the other kids and you know when they were finger painting looked up to him or her and knew <laughs> that that was a leader and uh, i but i wasn't that i wasn't that person i mean you know nobody's perfect at this stuff and i always thought of it as that all you can do is the best you can do and i think you remember that i always used to i drove myself crazy when i was associate in a law firm you know and you'd work on a brief or something you could always make it better what makes you stop after 10 hours? Why not work 200 hours? Why not read proofread it an 85th time? And stuff like that. And, you know, and that could be capacity, but at some point, and one of the virtues of here is life goes on, the pages turn, they whether do. you turn them or not. And so all you could do is the best you can do. Sometimes it's a virtue to have more to do than you can get done because you don't dwell and you don't obsess about things. And, you know, it's not a better job. So, you know, you're not going to get a better result going through the 95th draft that you do after the fourth one. Um, and so sometimes it's good to have, you know, big, you know, big portfolio stuff to do. And, but you remind yourself, all I could do is the best you could do. I go into meetings with a very um, critical and consequential and these things. And, you know, I'm like everybody else. I take a deep, you know, I take a deep breath going into these things. I'm always doing stuff I never did before. But, you know, you do acquire a certain more amount of confidence just by, like, surviving. And, you know, like, I, you know, how many times can you look into the abyss and worry whether it's bottomless or not? You know, gosh, you've, got, you've, you've gone down and climbed up 10 times. The 11th time, you know, you, know you're not, and you know it's not bottomless. You get through it. So Lloyd uh, and I have worked together a long time. Uh, I've worked in Lloyd's uh, world. Uh, since I joined the firm, and one of the interactions that I have that was memorable on the long list of interactions that were memorable was once um, I was torturing myself over, you know, whether I made the right decision or whether I was doing the right thing, and and Lloyd, you know, basically said to me, you know, the only reason I'm not torturing you is you're doing a pretty darn good job on yourself. All you can do is the best that you can do, whether those were the exact words or not. But um, the next step to that was, and you need to get on with it, right? You need to get on with it um, and move forward. And so uh, not only has he uh, thought that way himself, um, he's sort of shared that knowledge. And it's one of the things that I always remember. You just do the best that you can. But that's not, by the way, in this job, I could, th I could go to bed at night mm. thinking, this is what I want to do in the morning. And overnight, an economic statistic comes out at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's a surprise. Something's happened. No matter what I thought, I, you know, on the night before was going to be the most important thing I had to do the next day, the world reordered it for me and I had to respond to it. You mentioned that individuals come in as individuals, um, but then there's this ethos of concessions and collaboration. You're talking about the firm's culture there? You know, culture-wise, um, a lot of different aspects of the firm. It's hard to, you know, if you lived in this firm for a while, you kind of pick it up like a, like a language. Um, but I'd say it's generally people who, um, you know, motivated to be the best they can, like other people, can get along with other people, you know. To be effective in the world, you give yourself credit for what you do, but you, but you add the ways in which you make other people better, and you have to subtract the way you make other people worse. And so if you can also galvanize other, a team, and make everybody else on that team better. Mm. That inures to your benefit, but if we throw you in a mix and the mix is, doesn't work as well as it did without you, those are all demerits. You can't do everything. You can't. You can't do, you have to pick, what do you want to do and what do you want to have other people do? Because you can't do everything. Even if you're better than everybody at everything, you can't do everything. So you can place, but if you, so if you buy yourself, you're going to own a bigger share of it, but it's going to be small ball. So uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank all of you for joining us this summer.